Redemption is always the redemption of creation. And here's the good news. What happens when you flourish is you become more you. You become more that person God had in mind when he first thought you up. God wants you to become a new creation, but new doesn't mean completely different. Instead, it's like an old motorcycle that gets restored to its intended beauty. So here's where we start. There is a God, and it is not you. This means you're not your handiwork, and your life is not your little project. Your life is God's project. Only God knows your full potential, and God is guiding you toward that best version of you all the time. God has many tools, and God is never in a hurry. Now that can be frustrating for us, but even in our frustration, God's at work to produce patience in us. God never gets discouraged by how long it takes. And God delights every time you get it right, every time you grow. Only God can see this best version of you. And God is more concerned with you reaching your full potential than you are. God made you to flourish, to receive life from outside yourself that creates vitality in you and produces blessing beyond you. Flourishing is God's gift and God's plan. And when it happens, you're in harmony with God, with other people, with yourself, even with creation. Flourishing, though, is not measured by outward signs. It's not about how much money you make or what you own or how you look. It means becoming the person God had in mind when he created me. It means moving towards God's best version of me. God thought you up, and God knows just what you're intended to be. He has many good works for you to do, but they're not like to-do lists, the kind that we give spouses or employees. They're signposts to your true self. As God helps you grow, you will change, but this is very important, you will always be you. An acorn can grow into an oak tree, but it cannot grow into a rose bush. It could be a healthy oak, it could be a stunted oak, but it won't be a shrub. You will always be you. You could be a growing healthy you or a languishing you, but God did not create you to be anybody else. God pre-wired your temperament. He determined your natural gifts and your talents. He made you to feel certain passions and no desires. He planned your body and your mind. All of your uniqueness is God designed. And what happens when you flourish is, you actually kind of become more you. You become more that person God had in mind when he thought you up. You don't just become holier, you become you -ier. You will change. God wants you to become a new creation. But new does not mean completely different. God doesn't want to exchange you, he wants to redeem you. If you're a bookish contemplative type waiting for God to change you into the kind of guy that wears lampshades on their heads at parties, Good luck on that. Maybe you're a raging extrovert and you get tired of putting your foot in your mouth all the time. Don't you wish you could become more like those of us who are more introverted, wise, calm, restrained? It's never gonna happen. But to be redeemed and to flourish as the me God wants me to be, there are some alternative me's I will have to stop being. God designed you to be you. And so he will not ask you, why weren't you Moses or David or Esther or Peter or Mary or John Ortberg? If you don't pursue the life we're talking about, he'll ask you, why weren't you you? God designed us to delight in our actual lives. 
And of course, pretending to be somebody I'm not is really hard work. That's why we feel so tired after a first date or a job interview or someplace where I feel like I gotta project an image. It's why we're drawn to transparency and we long to go someplace where we can just be ourselves. Such a relief not to have to pretend to pray more than I do or to know more than I actually do or to be more humble than I really am. Inside you is a real person without pretense or guile. And the good news is we never have to pretend with God. In fact, genuine brokenness pleases God more than pretend spirituality. If I'm ever going to get to the real me I want to be, I have to start by being honest about the me I am. Every one of us has a me that we think we should be, which is at odds with the me that God made us to be. Sometimes letting go of that self may be a relief. Sometimes it'll kind of feel like death. I grew up with the need to think of myself as a leader, to think of myself as stronger and more popular and more confident than I really was. I used to run for class president because grown-up leaders would always say things like, you know, even when I was in high school, I was class president and I would think up slogans and campaign hard, but I always lost. And the truth that I didn't want to look at was I was just more introverted and bookish and less of a class president type than I wanted anybody to think. Now, should is a real important word for spiritual growth. But God's plan for you ultimately is not that you obey Him because you should, even though you don't want to. Ultimately, He made you to want His plan for you. On the other side of death is freedom, and nobody is more free than a dead man. Jesus had a lot to say about death to self. It's real important. And on that journey to the me you want to be, you'll have some dying to do. But that kind of death is always death to a lesser self, to a false self, so that a better and nobler self can come to life. Did you know everybody in your life wants you to change? Your boss wants you to be more productive. Your health club wants you to be more fit. Your credit card company would like it if you were in more debt. Networks want you to watch more TV. Restaurants want you to eat more food. Your dentist would love it if you visited more often. Everybody has an agenda for you, even your mother. This is the me other people want you to be. But if I spend my life trying to become that me, I will never be free. You know, loving people means being willing sometimes to disappoint them. Jesus loved everybody, but that meant at some point he disappointed everybody. Seeking to become the me other people want me to be is really a hollow way to live. Nobody else can tell you exactly how to change because nobody knows but God. Jesus did not say, I have come that you might follow my rules. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it with abundance. It's a fascinating study not long ago by the Barna Group that found a primary challenge in helping people grow spiritually is that most people equate spiritual growth with trying hard to follow the rules in the Bible. No wonder people also said they find themselves not motivated to pursue spiritual growth. Because if I think God's aim is to produce rule followers, spiritual growth will always be in the obligation category rather than in the want to category. The Apostle Paul wrote, rule keeping does not naturally evolve into living by faith, but only perpetuates itself into more and more rule keeping. It only results in a rule keeping, desire smothering, joyless, emotion controlling, self-righteous person who I don't want to become. I cannot follow God if I don't trust that He really does have my best interests at heart. When I cease to understand spiritual growth as moving towards God's best version of myself, then the question, how's your spiritual life going, gets real scary. I get a chronic sense of guilt, and I want to say, ah, it's not going very well, not as good as it should be going. And I'll be tempted to use external behaviors and following certain rules to measure my spiritual health rather than actual growth and love and joy. 
I'll measure my spiritual life by how early do I get up in the morning to read the Bible or how long is my quiet time or how often do I go to church? We have been overrun by what a friend of mine calls TLAs, three-letter acronyms. The most memorable one I've ever heard of comes from the field of medicine, the initials FTT. My wife first introduced them to me. Nance was trained to be a nurse, and to this day, she loves to diagnose people. She's always telling me her private diagnoses of people, even total strangers. If Nancy gets a good look at your face and the light is okay, she can pretty much tell you how long you have to live. But of all the diagnoses I've ever heard her discuss, FTT is the one that sticks in my mind. It gets entered into the chart of an infant who, for unknown reasons, is unable to gain weight or to grow, and it stands for failure to thrive. What sad words. Often, people have dreams for their life when they're young, but over time, they simply give up. They fail to thrive. There's a writer and an artist, Gordon McKenzie, talks about visiting children. When they're in kindergarten and he asks them, who here is an artist? Every hand shoots up. This decreases to about half the class when they're in third grade. And by the time they're 12 years old, only a few hands still believe that they could be an artist. Over time, a lot of us find that becoming the me that we were meant to be is too hard or takes too long. And when we give up on our growth, on our destiny, we languish. But there is a person inside you waiting to come alive. I know a man named Tim who was an addict, lost his family, lost everything, found God, and gave up his addiction and got his life back. I know a man named Peter who was a tormented slave to sexual impulses, and God got a hold of him, and that changed. I know a woman who hated confrontation so badly, she once sat in a car with her best friend for three days in silence to avoid confrontation. And today, she confronts recreationally. Most important, God wants you to grow. See, God is the one who created the idea of growth. There's a fabulous line in the Talmud that says, that every blade of grass has an angel bending over it, whispering, grow, grow. The Apostle Paul said that in Jesus, the whole redeemed community grows and builds itself up in love. Even you can't tell yourself how to change because you didn't create you. To love someone is to desire and work toward them becoming the best version of themselves. And the one person in all the universe who can do this perfectly for you, who can love you that way, is God. God alone has no other agenda. God has no unmet needs he's hoping you can help him with. And God knows exactly what the best version of you looks like. He delighted in the idea of it, and he's already at work on it. The Apostle Paul said, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. God is at work every moment to help you become his best version of you. Jesus once said that with God, all things are possible. The great thing about life with God is your next step is always possible. That next step towards God and the person God wants you to be is always waiting, no matter what you've done or how bad you've messed up. Jesus was hanging on a cross with a thief hanging next to him. Jesus turned to him and said, this day you will be with me in paradise. No matter who you are, there is always a next step toward the me you want to be.